I work additively with metal where, where I employ a variety of fabrication techniques such as welding, cutting, and pressing. I also um, form metal using a lot of traditional blacksmithing techniques as well as metal smithing. I cast my sculptures in bronze using resin bonded sand and lost wax casting. I also work subtractively um, where I carve stone and also plaster using hand and um, hand and power tools. Um, I work with wood sometimes, although I'm pretty allergic, so I try to steer away from that, but sometimes I just have to. I am also starting to work with epoxy sculpt because I need to find some cheaper material to make very large public installations. So I will go into detail about a couple of these processes later in my presentation. I would like to read you my artist statement so that you can kind of think about it as I delve into my background. So I explore the spaces between the fantasy and reality of our natural world to discover and highlight where they most intersect. I hunt through notes from scientific research and imagery of organisms in both the micro and macroscopic scale to gather repetitive patterns, textures, and related similarities within their life cycles and appearances. These findings influence sculptures that do not seek to imitate previous or present life, but establish organic possibilities. Ultimately, I seek to delight the senses, inciting playful, curious exploration and the urge to wonder what exists in the universe still unacknowledged while pondering what those inward excitements can mean for our time here. I imagine my work to create discomfort and nostalgia, a sense of something mysteriously familiar that reaches into the deep dark spots in our collective memory that steer our perceptions of what does and doesn't belong in our world. All right, so the screen is sharing. So if you'd like to see more of my work, here's my website and also my Instagram page. And if you want my email, it is also on my website. So I was born and raised in Missoula, Montana. Spending most of my time outdoors as a child in this beautiful state has influenced my practice more than anything. I enjoyed creating art out of absolutely anything growing up. I used my mother's favorite lipstick that was discontinued to draw pictures all over the bathroom walls when I was a kid. I once took a can of house paint and used the entire living room carpet as my canvas, which of course had to be replaced later. Well, pretty quickly afterwards. Um, my mother always reacted to these bursts of creative expression with love and understanding since she knew that I was an artist. I worked in the two-dimensional realm for a long time. This is an acrylic painting that I made when I was quite a bit younger. I also explored photography, drawing, and printmaking. Um, Visually articulating my thoughts and ideas was part of my daily routine, and it was a very therapeutic way to navigate a rather chaotic childhood. These are a couple acrylic paintings. Um, I began to work in three-dimensional realm through ceramic work. This ceramic piece actually played a really pivotal role in my awareness around the power of art. I created it really with no intention besides the technical restraints of using only coils of clay to build the entire sculpture. I showed my mother this piece and upon looking at it, she knew that she had cancer. She went to the doctor, had a colonoscopy, and sure enough, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. This experience as a 17 year old was just kind of mind boggling that a piece of art could trigger a person to discover and learn something about themselves that otherwise may have remained hidden, or she probably would have found out about it too late. Um, I began to believe in the power of art and its ability to tap into the human consciousness on a really meaningful level, and soon after this, my undergraduate education decidedly began at a private art school in Seattle, Washington. So this was one of my favorite pieces from my time at Cornish College of the Arts. Um, it was an interactive sound sculpture built out of wire and paper mache. This piece was meant to be used by two people, one person goes inside of the piece, which you can see there's kind of like an opening right here, while someone drops a marble through a hole at the top, which then lands onto a tube that runs through the entire sculpture, creating an immersive sound experience. After a year at Cornish, I became disillusioned with the seemingly self-centered and insular nature of developing a private art practice. And I felt kind of discouraged that I was not instead working towards a more holistically minded life prioritizing the inspiration and assistance to others. Having overcome life's obstacles through artistic means, I felt I was in the best position to help others with a similarly visual mindset um, and developmental manner. So I set out to obtain a degree in art therapy, which brought me to my, the Evergreen State College. 
My first year at Evergreen consisted of courses in a variety of subjects centered around art, philosophy, and psychology. Of these, I found myself just gravitating towards the metal shop um, where I was able to quickly compound on technical skills in that medium. This is the first piece that I actually ever made out of metal. It's a sculptural box lined with satin. I completely and utterly fell in love with using metal as an artistic medium. I was captivated by its limitless potential. Um, it offered me just a challenge unlike any other medium that I've ever worked with before. After a year, my enthusiasm and familiarity with the metal shop was recognized and I was offered a job as a studio aide and soon after a proficiency trainer, which is a specific studio aide and teacher's assistant in charge of administering the knowledge necessary to clear students for use of the facilities. Teaching and mentoring peers in the metal shop throughout the rest of my undergraduate career was a very transformative experience and it allowed me to help actualize um, um, help others actualize themselves in an educational role while also practicing as an artist. So it kind of helped me go 360 back to what I was initially intending to do when I went to art school. Manipulating metal was exciting as I realized it could be well suited to public art, an avenue allowing me to positively influence a larger audience. So here's the sculpture made out of stainless steel. <clears throat> it's titled Reflective Balance. It has been installed in seven different locations over the last five years in Montana and Washington. So confident in my determined trajectory, I directed my efforts to prepare myself for graduate school with the intentions to become a teacher and a working sculptor. I worked as a teacher's assistant for five different professors in 11 different curriculums to develop a context for what makes a successful educator. Um, I also sought out internships and fellowships with local sculptors like Ross Madison and Bob Leverich, where I was able to witness and participate in the inner workings of a professional artistic practice. I furthered my studies through a resident internship at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center in West Rutland, Vermont, where I worked with international stone artists while developing my instructional skills in a real world atmosphere. The main building, which you're seeing in this picture here, um, is where the studio operates out of, and it was the old Vermont Marble Company store built in 1854. So for three months with four other interns, I assisted over 30 professional artists and teachers, many whose primary artistic medium was stone, but also wood, metal, glass, and mixed media. People came from all over the world to teach, learn, and collaborate at this studio. Behind the studio are 160 acres of an inactive quarry site, so there was a lot of really, really cool property to explore. This is an old railway system that was used to transport marble across the property. So I worked for the studio full time and used my free time to make a couple marble pieces. My first piece I carved entirely <clears throat> using hand tools, just a hammer and some chisel. So it took an incredibly long time. This, of course, was very rewarding when I was finished. After this piece, I only had, um, here's it completely finished. After this piece, I only had a few weeks left of my internship, so I decided that I was gonna use power tools this time and make something a bit larger and faster. Here I am working, um, using an angle grinder to make uh, fret cuts on this piece. Fret cutting is a method in stone carving that allows you to remove a lot of material very quickly you cut several parallel lines. So I was sharing with you um, fret cutting. So you cut a bunch of parallel lines into a piece of stone about a half an inch to two inches deep. And then you come back in with a chisel up against the cut at an angle and knock them off the stone with a hammer. It's a really satisfying experience and it's probably one of my favorite processes in carving stone. So you come back in with a chisel at an angle and then you knock them off with a stone. I guess I just said that part, I believe. So here's another shot um, of it in process. And you can also see my workbench covered in tools, which you can see that I'm not very organized when I'm creating art, at least when I'm in the throes of it. Here's the final piece. Both of these sculptures are on display at the Carving Studios Gallery. So this experience um, was really pivotal in my artistic career and was encouraging and left me feeling very hopeful that I was going to be able to succeed as a working artist. When I came back from Vermont, I was itching to create a cohesive 
body of work that incorporated both metal and stone. So this is when I finished my first series of um, sculptural work and I really feel like this is kind of when my career started to launch. Um, I'll share with you a little bit of the process of using the lost wax method. Specifically in this case, it was gravity casting. On the left are all of the small, oh, on the left over here, are all of the small waxes that I built directly by molding warm wax with my hands, which kind of moves like clay once you get it soft enough. Then I made a sprue tree that you can see in the middle here. A sprue tree is what leads the, leads the molten metal into the sculpture. This isn't pictured, but I also invested the sprue tree. Um, investing is when you um, put your sprue tree inside of sort of a vessel and then cover the entire wax in a plaster mix. The wax was then burnt out of the investment in a kiln for several days. Bronze was poured into the negative cavity that is left after the wax is removed from the mold. Um, the picture on the right is the rough bronze before I cleaned all the plaster off of it. Here is the sprue tree in bronze. Then I cut each individual piece off the sprue tree and then finish them individually using power tools, which is an incredibly laborious process. And also when you're grinding off a lot of that metal, it ends up flying off of you in little tiny bronze needles, which is always fun. So here is one of the <clears throat> final bronze and stone pieces. I titled the series Interposing Interjections. Each piece is titled Protomorphs with an identifying number. Protomorph is something that is primitive in structure or form. So I'm gonna read you a little bit about this work. Um, I aim to eliminate the complexities of communication in its earliest, simplest forms. From the division of the cell to the expansive ecology of today, we have all used some version of the mother tongue to get along, gestures, implications, signals. These are the building blocks that inform our ever fluid place amongst others and our most primitive tools as we advance together as one. These biomorphic forms are intended to allude to many different things that we use to communicate, such as body parts like our tongues, hands, and yes, genitalia. Also food and objects that people often use to show gratitude and love. I was inspired also by many things that we don't see, but maybe using to communicate on a deeper level like the pituitary gland. In many spiritual um, practices, the pituitary gland is often referred to as the third eye and is associated with higher awareness and higher consciousness. Some of the forms are cast in bronze while others are carved out of stone. From Vermont, I shipped back a couple hundred pounds of various kinds of stones. So I use this series as an opportunity to explore the uniqueness of each kind of stone. I used alabaster, soapstone, green verde, marble, and also granite. I also created a couple color film series using stone, um, my stone carved protomorphs as models. After ser this series, I knew that I would continue investigating ideas through sculpture by creating a series of work rather than just one unified piece. And that has remained a constant in my practice ever since then. <clears throat> this leads me to the next body of work, which is Fictitious Forces. And all nine of these sculptures in this series are currently displayed in downtown Olympia and have been for the last six months as part of the Olympia Art Alliance storefront project. It's very difficult to get good photographs with the glass reflections, but here are some. Um, which thankfully the Olympia Art Alliance was able to get for me because I was unable to get any ones very successfully. So I started this series about six years ago. The first sculpture that I made was actually created without the intent that it would become a series. I was just exploring linear steel for the first time. I wanted to express frozen movement using welded rod. I don't know about other artists, but I often find that I don't always know what I'm doing until the piece or series of works is completely finished. The artwork communicates to me during the creative process. I start with an idea that continues evolving as I move my way through the material. I find this to be even more apparent when I carve stone. I want the work to tell me something that I didn't know before. That's part of the fun of creating. My work is always alive, even, um, even though it's, it is stagnant, but I'm constantly reinterpreting my work. It is never in a conceptually fixed state, even if it's physically finished. Here is the largest sculpture in this series. It is entirely made out of stainless steel sheet. I'll show you a couple of process photos of this because it was very technically challenging for me. I cut up strips of stainless steel and bent them using a slip roller to make these very consistent curves. 
Every single shape is made up of two to eight strips of metal. This piece on the right is made up of just two, but this one on the left, I had to use four to create the whole form since a sheet of metal is only so long. So I clamped them and formed strips. <clears throat> I clamped them and then tack welded them with a TIG welder before I was able to remove all the clamps and then weld the pieces together entirely. Then I ground on the welds using various power tools so that the connections were seamless and looked like one solid strip of metal was used to make each shape. The picture on the top right shows you all the shapes that I used to form the entire sculpture. Here you can see the beginning stages of me welding the shapes together and at least on the bottom right here. And I'm turning each piece using a rotating reference frame before place. Here's the piece with a black background so you can kind of see it a bit better and with some really nice lighting on it too. The piece is five feet wide. A fictitious force is a force that appears to act on a mass whose motion is described using a non-inertial frame of reference, such as an accelerating or rotating reference frame. The picture on the left is the sculpture installed in the storefront window, um, and on the right is taken in my studio, and this one's made out of steel rod. I was thinking a lot about Plato's theory of forms while I was creating each piece in this series. I started with what I see as um, a pure form, which is, according to Plato, the basis of reality, which then repeats, grows, and moves as if a fictitious force is being exerted on it. These sculptures fossilize growth, movement, and time. I like the idea of using form, which, according to Plato, is non-physical and extra mental, then bringing it into the physical realm by sculpting a fractal life form into existence, <clears throat> this piece is actually really tiny. It's only about six inches wide. For Plato, forms only live in the mental realm, such as beauty, and are more real than any objects that imitate or express them. A uh, mental form is unchanging and timeless, while physical things that exude the form are in a constant change of existence. Forms are unqualified perfection. Physical things are qualified and conditioned. So these are all the things that I'm kind of think that I'm thinking about while I'm creating this work and processing a lot of the things that I feel that the work is telling me. We were unable to install lighting for the installation since the building doesn't have any power, but the shadows of this piece, these pieces are just as powerful as the sculptures themselves, at least to me. It also got me to think a lot about Plato's allegory of the cave, which is something that I ponder a lot when I see, um, see the shadows projected from my work. And that happens a lot with um, all of my other bodies of work too as well. The shadows always seem to play a very interesting role in the conversation. As I get wrapped up in the process of creating the repetitive geometric shapes, it feels like I'm visually capturing intelligibility philosophy, which is thought thinking about itself. Um, without the senses being involved, just thought. I like imagining some of these sculptures being the human mind reflecting in on itself. It also, these kind of make me ponder uh, the, the problem of universals and how the philosophical discussion has evolved over time. And I enjoy bringing that uh, concept into the reality of my work, um, into reality through my artwork. On the right here is the one actually in the installation and on the left is a photograph I took in the studio. So here I am installing the work and a big shout out to my sister Aria and her partner Nick for helping me install it. I wouldn't have been able to do that without them. And also to Lucy Gentry and Carl Schmuel also for helping as well. This is um, the most recent piece that I finished in this series. Here I am working on it in my backyard. I made it this year, literally the day before um, the installation of all of the sculptures. I needed one more piece that kind of pulled all the works together. So I initially wasn't planning on having it in, in the installation, but I needed one of similar scale to the other pieces. This piece is made out of 100 wooden dowel pieces in the Kind of center and middle area and 90 small strips of wood on the outside to form these triangles. 
It is two feet in length. The next body of work that I'm going to share with you is titled Of the Abyss. I created many of the pieces from this series using resin bonded sand casting. With this method, usually you make a mold and then you ram sand around the mold, but I instead ran two solid blocks of sand and carved what I wanted my sculptures to look like directly into the sand using a Dremel tool and various clay tools. These are three molds that I carved. And here's what those carvings ended up looking like in their positive form. This process was very exciting because it allowed me to think additively and subtractively all in one sculpture. I'm going to read you um, my statement for this body of work. Like buried treasure, the fragments of life will at times reveal themselves to me within the material. The stratification of sediment or the petrified husk of an animal long dead allude to the songs and stories of an ancient world untouched by typical people, but whose reveries continue to be expressed today. A vast unseen world primarily controlled by equally invisible forces, its inhabitants both adapting and surrendering to the constant flux. This fauna and their extraneous existence in the abyss spurred the body of this work through line, repetition, and texture. These sculptures memorialize the efficacy of natural design, so evident in the creatures who exist without cessation under the forces of the ocean currents. For this series, I looked at hundreds of microscopic images of deep sea creatures in an attempt to create a sort of visual catalog in my mind to inspire my own version of creatures that could live in the deep sea. This piece is titled Aqueous and it was part, um, it was the final part of the abyss body of work that I made to kind of finish it off. Um, it is installed or was installed at Percival Landing where it won the People's Choice Award. So it was installed in City Hall for a year and then it was <clears throat> And it was in Percival Landing for a year as well. And the city of Olympia now owns the piece and it'll be eventually installed in front of the Olympia Center. This piece is made entirely out of copper. The creature is a hollow vessel that I formed by hand. There are 29 pieces of copper sheet that I formed separately using traditional metal smithing techniques, mostly using a torch to anneal the metal, then a metal stake and a hammer to form it into shape. Each piece is TIG welded into an internal skeleton and also to each other. All of the pieces on the bottom are copper tubes that I forged while the copper was red hot. This brings me to my next body of work. And this body of work is one that I've been working on in total for the last um, about two years. I have finished about 40 sculptures in this body of work and I have about 60 more unfinished bronze castings to go to continue adding to it. The body of work is titled Petra Flores. The floral form of all these pieces is cast in bronze using lost wax casting, specifically centrifugal casting, and all of these pieces are tabletop size. I cast them in Seattle. The environment that the creatures are erupting out of is just organic stone and it's in its raw form. The body of work was inspired by characteristics of organisms such as cordyceps, cordyceps, endoliths, and related parasites. This research um, culminated in the creation of otherworldly extremophiles who thrive in various forms of stone, slowly taking over their host habitat and sprouting forth. I have named them Petroflores, this family of bronze organisms called Petroflores, although they each have their own species names. Perhaps the first question we ask ourselves when presented with an unknown, something that doesn't comfortably fit in our logic, uh, <clears throat> fit our perceived logic, is whether it is alive or inanimate. This base delineation can immediately assist us in directing our reaction to this, but how does that subconscious mental equation affect and to continue to shape our reality? This body of work examines the importance of auditing our collective perception of the known and the development of personal agency that can come from constant questioning of the world, its inhabitants, and our constructed systems. Allowing ourselves a, <clears throat> a pause before performing that subconscious equation when viewing a mysterious yet familiar thing gifts our spirits a moment to reflect internally instead of being bombarded by explanations. And that is all I have to share with you for the PowerPoint. 
So now I'm going to, if I can do this properly, stop sharing and show you my face again. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know that was a lot of information. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was great to see and hear. Um, I have just a couple questions about the storefront process, but I wanted to open it up to all of the guests to see if they had any questions um, first. Hey, Sarah, it's Lucy here. You've, you've worked in so many materials. Do you have a favorite one that you're working with? And I'm curious if you have a moment to talk about epoxy and how you would work with that. Um, the favorite material is always the material that I'm working with and <laughs> at that time. So that's always kind of fluctuating. Um, okay. And that's kind of the same if you would ask me what my favorite piece of work is as well as the one that I recently finished or the one that I'm working on. Um, epoxy sculpt is something that I've just been making little mo models for it. So I've been building an armature and then I have been adding aluminum to that armature, like aluminum foil around it to add a little bit of girth and texture. And then I am putting epoxy sculpt around it. Um, it's actually really exciting for me because I can actually start and finish a piece very fairly quickly without having to wait for the casting process or without having to sand a piece of stone for like a hundred hours before I actually can deem it to be finished. So I'm actually really excited. Um, and I also can charge a lot less for my work that way, which is something that I've been trying to do. I've been hopefully making my work a lot more affordable for people. Sorry, is epoxy sculpt, it's not the kind of stuff I would be using at home to like repair old wood. It's actually a material you can buy. Um, yeah, you, you can use it to repair things like that as well. I actually think it's, there are a lot of different grades of it, but a lot of it's used to like repair boats. There's a lot of mm -hmm. marine grade levels of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, thank but you. It is, I mean, it is fairly toxic. Yeah. <laughs> so you should be wearing a respirator when you're using it. And okay. also you can, when it's hard, you can actually remove material and carve it like stone. And that's when you really need to be wearing a respirator. But that's why I find it to be an incredibly intriguing material to work with because I can both work additively and subtractively with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Sarah? Well, I have a couple. So if you come up with something, just let me know. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to ask, you did mention it, and thanks for showing us photos um, of the storefront project that you have up right now. But I just um, have been curious to ask all the artists, what was the process like? I mean, you said you uh, had help and that you needed that help. What was the process like installing, and how was that similar or different than installing in, like, say, a gallery space? Um you had to think a lot more on your feet because you didn't really know exactly what you were getting into. Like we had a bunch of pipes that were above that we could actually hang the material on, but they were covered in, um, it wasn't actually asbestos, but they were covered um, in a, I can't even, I can't even think of the material right now, of insulation. So we had to remove that before we could actually use the space. So you have to be a lot more innovative if it's not like working in a traditional gallery. But I like that because you have just all this freedom to kind of invade this space, mm -hmm. which um, is something that I'm looking forward to as far as um, my artistic career progresses. I really want to create very invasive installations so that I can just totally take over a space and really provide you with an experience. Very cool. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so did anyone have any other questions for Sierra before we wrap up? Sierra, I just, um, this is Tracy Jameson. Um, I'm on our, we, I, we communicated through email. Oh yeah, you sent me the pictures, yes. I did. Um, and um, I just, I wanna tell you how much I appreciated you taking the time, I mean, such a beautiful presentation you gave us tonight, um, taking the time to take us, you know, your whole life's journey and just how interesting it is 
you know, to follow an artist through their career, like you, you took us tonight, you know, how one thing sort of led to another and other openings and, and sort of, I love your brain and the philosophy and science that you've put into your work. It's really inspiring. And um, I can't wait to watch, you know, to follow your career. It's exciting. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really am. I'm so appreciative of you taking part in um, in our little baby program <laughs> at ArtSpace. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. I'm really excited that this uh, his program is actually up and running and has actually been very successful. I've seen it pop up in lots of cities around the country, and I've heard a lot of mixed information about how uh, successful or not successful it has turned out but I think in Olympia it has gone really well and I think it's only been occurring for the last year what year and a half yeah so. that's yeah that's correct and um and as a board we are really um all feel like it's an important thing especially now with um you know the state of the world <laughs> To, um, to just have that little bright corner. It makes me so happy when I drive by and I see your work in the window and you see it all activated instead of dark, you know, a dark space that it's been for years and years and years. And, and you know, hopefully as we are able to like actually see people, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll, we can inspire some other windows, you know, that aren't occupied, you know, to do the same. You know, we'd like it to keep keep going for now, which is a good thing. Yeah, we need art more than ever right now. Oh, amen to that. <laughs> amen to that. It really is a perfect project for the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, all right, I, last I, call for, oh, no. Hi, hi Sarah. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, hearing the background of your story and, and hearing, like Tracy said, like your philosophy and what went into your your forms that you came up with, and really, I I really think a lot about uh, viruses and things like that and the structure of viruses, as you know. But um, <laughs> they really remind me of this. Um, like you were talking about this this world between the living and the not living and where do you draw that line mm -hmm. like, is a virus living or is it not living it depends on how you look at it or how you define living right and mm -hmm. it's it's almost like you know these rocks have a life in them that that you're you're bringing out of these rocks like it's uh it's almost like it once you see that form growing on that rock, you're like, oh yeah, naturally that form would come out of that rock. Why didn't right. I see that, you know? And, but it's something <laughs> you see and you bring to life. I think it, it's, really, uh, it's really interesting uh, how you're imagining forms that could be on other worlds, extremophiles and things like that and how they adapt and, and how they grow out of that rock or that planet. And, you know, uh, it's really, it's really hits on so many uh, levels that I hadn't um, thought about before, but thanks for bringing all that, that out. And you said one part, especially about uh, Plato's cave and, and the shadows of, of the forms that may always make you think of the shadows projected on the walls of Plato's cave. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that's really profound. That's really cool. I've never put that together with art before the um that that concept but i really appreciate you articulating that you did you did it really well wow thank you stan <laughs> <laughs> i really appreciate it i yeah. have actually been thinking a lot about creating um i have an installation in mind that is kind of interpret interpreting a creature that isn't necessarily the virus but is inspired by that and what that could look mm -hmm. at and it's kind of um i'm thinking about the edge of chaos theory in combination with that because we think about um 
the theory suggests that there's a lot of create um, creative potential. It's the strongest when you're right at the edge of chaos before things totally break down into complete chaos. So I want to kind of visually analyze that. So that's well, been something I've been thinking about using epoxy sculpt to do that too. Wow. Huh. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, the timing one week before the election, better it's gonna be a creative week. <laughs> Well, we, I really appreciate having this diversion. And I mean, I think it's going to be more and more important as, you know, robots take over. We need, we need humans to tell human stories through art, through music, through poetry, through imagination. We, the more we connect and the more human we, um, the more, the more we humanize the world, the better off we'll all be. And you know, I think there's always gives me hope is uh, art and um, creativity and imagination and things that robots are incapable of. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing with us tonight. It was great to learn oh, more about your Nicole. process. Again, Sierra, let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Hey, and thank Nicole. you, Arts Space Alliance. Well, <laughs> Nicole, thank you so much for doing this. Um, this is, means so much to our community. And OAA thanks you for hosting all of our artists. And Sierra, that was a smashing lecture. You, you're just <laughs> an excellent artist, and I think you've had good teachers wherever you've been, because yeah, I look at, absolutely. I just think of you're doing everything right to move forward, to have a successful career. Listening to you talk about building groupings of art is so important getting into galleries, not just showing one piece, but whole series. So thank you for teaching us tonight. Thank oh, you. Nicole. Thank you, Lucy. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So sorry.